find a seat. I know it might be tough to find a seat today, but hopefully, hopefully you can kind of come up with one somewhere. Well, good morning, church. Um, as you come down and, and find a seat, do encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to pick up your communion, uh, communion uh, for later in the service, as well as uh, when you get to your seat, if you'll go ahead and fill out a communication card, that would be great. And those will be picked up toward the end of service. I know it's overcast this morning and uh, looks a little dreary outside, but it's uh, such a beautiful day because of all the smiling faces who we've seen as we have greeted this morning and fellowship this morning and talked, and we just thank you so much for being here with us today. Not only those of you who are here in person, but even those who are joining us online, and we very much appreciate your presence as we come this morning to worship and praise our Heavenly Father. You know, it's been a, a great few weeks in a lot of different ways as I was just kind of thinking back over the last month or so and thinking about uh, uh, all the things that were going on this summer with the teens and even finishing up the summer with camp on such a high note and then moving into preparations for our, our homecoming and our that celebration of our 70th anniversary and all that God has been doing in and through this church with so many people taking time to come throughout the week to help um, and even some in the evenings coming and, and helping as we were setting up, as we were getting ready for that and just to be able to see and, and hear and, and work alongside serve alongside of so many of you uh, who came to help out, whether it was on the front end getting ready or even the back end kind of helped cleaning up. And we just are so thankful for your willingness to come and help and just your presence and what you helped do uh, to make last Sunday uh, such a glorious day to be together. And it was a, a wonderful, wonderful time to come together and worship last Sunday with so many joining from our past who have been a part of this church family in different ways or have connections to this church family and to be able to reconnect with them, to be able to encourage each other, to strengthen each other, to uplift each other, and to be able to worship together in such a great and beautiful time. And we are here today. And to not overstate the obvious, uh, there's a few less people here. There's a few less voices to offer up praise as we enter into worship. But we are still here to worship God. We are still here to worship the same God that we worshiped yesterday. We are still here to praise God for who he is, for what he has done, and what he is going to continue to do. And so we've got a choice this morning. Whether there are 500 or whether there are 50, we can still fill this room with praise. All it takes is a willingness, a passion, a desire to share your love not only with God, but with each other as we encourage each other, as we lift each other up, as we offer our praise to God from the depths of our soul. Because as we do that, it comes together in such a beautiful melody of praise and worship. And so as we enter into worship this morning, let us stand as we hear from God's word. Good morning. We're going to start with a scripture reading this morning from the book of John. Uh, chapter 11, 45 through 50. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is the man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them, then one of them uh, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down, and we worship you, Lord, we bow down, and we worship you, Lord, we bow down, and we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be, you are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. 
You were king of the heavens before there was time, and king of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Come, let us all unite to sing, God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring, God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love. God is love, God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. Old Chelsea words remotest bound, God is love. In Christ we have redemption found, God is love. His blood has washed our sins away. His spirit turned our night to day. And now we can rejoice to say that God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. How happy is our portion here. God is love. His promises our spirit cheer. God is love. He is our son and shield by day. Our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the way. Our God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness, your faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. Of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known your steadfastness, your steadfastness. With my mouth will I make known your steadfastness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Lord, let your light Light of your face, shine on us. Lord, let your light, 
light of your face shine on us that we may be saved that we may at last to find our way in the darkest night let your light shine on us lord let your grace grace from your hand fall on us lord let your grace grace from your hand fall on us that we may be saved that we may have light to find a way in the darkest night let your grace fall on us lord let your love love with no end come over us lord let your love love with no end come over us that we may be saved that we may have light to find our way in the darkest night let your love come over us. Let your light shine on us. Please be seated. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for bringing us together for another glorious day to learn of your teachings through your word and your love and to sing your praises. Lord, be with our young people as they start another school year, those going to college, those advancing on into the grades that they were left from last uh, year. So please be with them. Help them grow continually within the Christianity life. Lord, be with our first responders, all of our doctors, our policemen, firemen, EMTs and the military serving our country and keeping us free abroad. Lord, those in our midst today, whatever trials and tribulations they may be going through, please be with them. Let them know that whatever darkness they're going through, that you're with them, you will be in their heart. Lord, please be with us today as we continue singing your praises and the teachings of your word from Martin today. God, be with us all. Be with our country. God bless us. And we love you so much, Lord. Jesus Christ, let me pray, man. Blessed Jesus, come to me. Soothe my soul with rays of peace. As I look to you alone, fill me with your love. Mountains high or valleys low, you will never let me go. By your fountain let me drink, fill my thirsty soul. Glorious, marvelous, grace that rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Blessed Jesus, come to me as I fall down at your feet. Let me touch your nail-scarred hands, Jesus, I would see. 
glorious, marvelous, great such rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Glorious, marvelous, great such rescued me. Holy, worthy is the Lamb who died for me. Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Love hopes all God is love, 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 God is love. God is love, God is love, God is love. Love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, all thy strength, all thy mind. Love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart. For God is love, God is love, God is love. Love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart. With all thy soul, all thy strength, all, all thy mind, love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart. For God is love, God is love, God is love. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the soul of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost our way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, 
Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Just, we are so blessed because of what God has done for us. We are so blessed that long before we existed his precious love gave us a way to come into his presence for eternity and because he knew we would fall short he prepared a perfect sacrifice even before creation and because of that blessing we come together around this table with these cups with this bread and we celebrate the most beautiful, the most amazing gift ever. If you don't have a cup, if you'd raise your hand, someone from the back will come around and bring one to you. So as we celebrate, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we cannot begin to imagine the depth of love that you have for us. We can't begin to imagine how you knew the creation that you would bring into this world would fail. And yet you made a provision, Father. You decided that you would give part of yourself to give up glory, to empty himself, to come to earth, to live alongside us and yet to do it perfectly and then to give that perfect life as a sacrifice. Father, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your love is overwhelming. And we are so limited in the ways we can say thank you. We're so limited in the ways we can serve you. We're so limited in the ways we can come before you and praise you, Father. And yet we pray that you'll accept our simple gifts. And Father, we pray that you will help us to take the time, not just now, as we enter into this supper, but every moment of our lives to examine ourselves and to keep ourselves in a right relationship with you. Father, bless this bread, bless this cup, and thank you for the amazing gift of love that you give. In Jesus' name, amen.
last week, we kind of had a lot going on. There were a couple of things that we didn't do that we probably should have done or could have done. One of which was to point to what I'm standing on this morning. I hope that all of you, uh, if you've not done so after we finish up today, will kind of walk down this direction and see what Junior and Stan have done. This new stage area is absolutely amazing. And uh, I didn't want to break kind of the theme last week to point it out. But, uh, I mean, it looks like it's been here for 70 years. I mean, it looked like it was made into the auditorium initially. It, it's got extra steps on it and monitors, and we're just kind of playing with discovery. So uh, if you get a chance, say something to the two of them and maybe others who uh, helped out. Amazing. The other thing that we didn't do last week was try to kind of re refer back to our year and what we're trying to do in this year. Uh, and, and there was allusion that was made to the banner on my right, your left, uh, which talks about our congregational goal, but we didn't make allusion to the one on my left, your right, which talks about what we're doing this year being rooted in Christ, rooted in Him. And just as a reminder for you, we started out at the beginning of the year doing this reverse chronology look at Jesus. We started with the ascension, we're going back to the birth, and we've picked up all kinds of different themes. So this month, we're talking about the history and how God and Christ has influenced and implemented history and the impact that they make on history. And so it's a little bit of a different lesson that we're doing today, but, but I wanted you to kind of get a sense of where we're headed with different parts of this. And so, so it's an important study that we're going to be doing uh, in this month of August. We're going to talk about God and Christ shaping history, etc. And, and I, I kind of introduced that last week. And this week, what I want to do is to introduce a basic model to you. And then once I get that model in front of you, we will apply it next week. So this is kind of the first part of a two-week study, if you will. And, and we're going to just kind of launch in talking about the importance of having a good perspective, okay? And I think there is a great value in doing what we did this year, uh, what Greg did putting together the videos and, and the like for our history of Riverwood because instead of focusing on a particular moment or event, we kind of sketch the big picture, if you will. Uh, I think the lowest amount of time we basically dealt with was a decade. And so we got to, to, got to get the big picture of how things were kind of coming together. And, and I think that's helpful because many times when we study the Bible, we study the Bible in very small sections. And so we'll look at a verse or we'll look at a chapter or we'll look at a book at a time. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But there's something to be said about sometimes stepping back away from the biblical text and like we got the history of Riverwood, getting the history of the Bible, getting that bigger perspective, if you will. And I, I think that helps us because sometimes we tend to get kind of lost in the details. And if we are careful and if we study the biblical text in a broader way, I, I think it will raise some concepts and ideas that maybe we don't normally see or think about. Now, I, I said this morning we were going to do a little bit of a different study, and so therefore I, I want to do this in a little bit of reverse. Usually I will put things together to build toward a final principle or concept, 
Today, I'm going to tell you what the concept is, where we're headed, and then we're going to unpack the biblical text to get there. And so to kind of start that, I, I want to begin with the notion that Scripture teaches that Satan, that the devil, that Lucifer, whatever name we want to talk about him, our historic enemy is the ruler of this world. We find Jesus making that statement in John's Gospel. We find Paul referring to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where he calls him the God of this age. And as an expression of that control, what we find from looking at the text and at history is that our enemy aligns, often aligns, political and religious systems to support his rejection of divine principle. And so therefore it follows that God's will and God's wishes generally stand counter to the dominant culture. This is a concept that appears repeatedly in the biblical text. We start with a very easy one. If you've got your Bible, your device with you, you want to follow along, we're going to touch base a number of times as we walk through the Scripture. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, we unfold in the opening verses some rudimentary facts. The world is bad and it's getting worse. Things are going from bad to worse and worse and then finally terrible. And it just continues to run downhill until finally God makes the decision it's not going to change, it's not going to get any better, he's just going to destroy it. But you'll recall that there is one man, and as we find later in the story, his family, a guy by the no man name of Noah, who stands before God and has God's favor. Now, we don't know in Genesis chapter 6 what the population of the world is. We're told early on that it is increasing. And so, does that mean there are 5 million, 10 million, 20 million people? We have no way of knowing what that might be. But we do know the ratio, and the ratio is 10 million or 20 million to 8. And so, I don't know how you calculate odds or you calculate winners and losers, but however you do so, in that scenario, it looks pretty bad. Satan is winning. And that's not the exception. I move forward to 1400 B.C. We're now in the book of Exodus. We are now in Egypt. And Egypt is the world's major mega power, if you will, of that time and that era. They are the strongest nation on earth. And they have a rather unique merger, kind of unique merger of the political and the religious. There is a Pharaoh who leads them who is considered to be a god, little g. When he dies, he gets to be a god, big g in their mind. And he is supported by a group of priests and religious authorities who bring this notion to the people. And it has a couple of really cool side effects, and that is that the people are in awe of their leader, of their Pharaoh, and they'll do anything for him. And so the priests benefit by being connected to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh benefits because he's never got to worry about a rebellion against his rule. And it is a wonderful system, a perfect marriage, if you will, as long as you are one of the five to maybe 10,000 ruling elites in Egypt. But what if you are one of the many millions of people who are the rank and file in that nation, in that culture? Well, you live under an incredibly dark in the book of Exodus, we encounter God's attempt to try to move 
uh, among his enslaved people. But we need to remember the Jews weren't the only people who were oppressed there. I mean, the, the, the pyramids had been built some thousand years earlier. And, and so we have this historic activity where this small number at the top are in charge and in control. And so God comes to Moses and he calls him to come and to go to Pharaoh and to tell him that his people need to be released. And really, there are going to be two concurrent tasks that Moses will fulfill. First, he's going to challenge the satanic system that is in place in Egypt. He's going to challenge their religion, their gods, their deities. And so in the plagues, one of the things that we see is that there is almost a matchup against their deities. And so as those things happen, those aren't accidental. They're actually against, and they show that these Egyptian gods and deities, they have no power. They are not true gods. And the final one of those, Pharaoh was supposed to protect you because he was the god. Remember the little g? And yet we find out in the death of the firstborn, he can't even protect his own family. So how can he be trusted to protect you? And so God is unfolding that action as this story in Exodus unfolds. But as I said, there's a second activity that's occurring. And that is that God is using Moses under the law to set in place a new system. A system that will be completely different, that will be defined differently. It will be God designed and there will be no knights, there will be no nobles, there will be no kings in this authority. And instead justice and compassion and freedom will dominate. And as an example or expression of that, uh, there will be under the law something called the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, all debts are going to be canceled. Whatever you might owe on your credit card or your mortgage, it just goes away in the year of Jubilee. And there is this wonderful restoration of things to their original Owners, original property reverts back to those who owned it initially. And so therefore there are no frisks, there are no ingrams that develop family fortunes that last for generations. Instead there is a redistribution of wealth every 49 years, an equality that exists among the people. Now if we were into the particulars and not flying along here at 35,000 feet, we would probably need to go into how well that was implemented. But for now, we're not going to do that. I will tell you that that was the system that was in place for about 400 years in the Jewish history and people. Good, bad times implementing it. But we come down about 400 years later, and the children of Israel become dissatisfied with the system that God has given them. And they look around at the nations that surround them and they say, we need to be like our neighbors. We want a king. And God laments that, but he allows it. And so he begins to implement it and he moves within the life of his prophet Samuel to have him to anoint Saul as the first king. And Saul is followed then by David. And then finally we get to Solomon. And during the reign of Solomon, there is a massive shift in the dominant culture now that occurs. And we don't often see it because we're dealing again with the details. Uh, but if, again, we're flying at this larger big picture area, there's some massive changes there is going to be a merger between the religious and the political sphere. And in the reign of Solomon, affluence is now going to become key. What you have and what you possess is going to become a major mark of that 
culture instead of the law's focus on equality. There will be conscripted uh, conscripted labor uh, from the villages. People are going to be forced into making these huge building projects that Solomon and the later kings will want to make. And when you have that, you need a, a permanent army. And how do you support a permanent army? Well, you've got to have taxes. And if you have taxes, you've got to have bureaucrats from the IRS that make sure it all gets collected and paid. And, and there's a merger, once again, there's a, a, a temple that is now built in Jerusalem. By the way, go through the law of Moses. I'll save you some time. Look for the word temple. It does not exist. The notion of a permanent temple of God in Jerusalem was not part of the law. It was added during the time of Solomon and David. And so now you've got this religious authority that is built in alongside the political authority in the capital city of Jerusalem. And it provides a union of king and priesthood that ultimately will control access to what is God's will. And so now, just as in Egypt, the religious and political forces are joined together, and what do they do? They profit off of the people. They profit off of the people. And this is the system that will move forward for about another 300 years. Again, sometimes better, sometimes worse. If you want an example of worse, Turn in your device, now over into the book of 1 Kings chapter 22. The nation of Israel has divided. There are two kingdoms. Judah is led by a king by the name of Jehoshaphat. He comes down to visit with Ahab, and Ahab has a great idea. Let's attack and invade one of our neighbors. And so Jehoshaphat... He says, well, before I do that, what I'd like to know is if this is God's will or not. And so King Ahab calls together a prophet, or actually 400 prophets. And he asks them in the biblical text what should happen. And so in verse, the end of verse 6 and 7, we read, go, they answered, for the Lord will give, you into the king's, give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? And here is Ahab's answer. There is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. You see, religion and politics in this era are mixed into this self-serving partnership that really comes to define their culture. Now Ahab is talking about one prophet that is a particular pain to him. There are many others because God does raise up real prophets and as he does, he's trying to decry and renounce the system that exists in the nation at that time. And he's calling the kings, he's calling the people back to their pure way of relating to God. And sometimes their critiques can get rather edgy. Here's Amos, the beginning of chapter 4. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, Bring us some drink. Here's the way it's said in Micah. Micah 2. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it's in their power to do so. When they covet fields and seize them and houses and take them, they defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Repeatedly we see that in the Old Testament. Now, as we follow this big picture into the New Testament, we find that the Romans and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are now in the first century in charge and in control of the life of the nation. And they may not like each other, but they have 
have an almost codependent unity uh, that oppresses the rank and file. They decide who wins and who loses. They decide who it becomes rich and who is poor. They decide who is in religiously and who gets left out. And that continues as that satanic system, just as it did back in Noah's days, in the days of Egypt, in the days of King Ahab. Well, Jesus comes along. And instead of playing their religious games, he talks about a God who loves the downtrodden, who loves the outsider, who loves those who are oppressed. And he teaches about forgiveness and compassion and love, concepts that aren't found among the ruling elite. And you would imagine that some might embrace that, but, uh, but Jesus is a threat to their power. And so in our text that was read this morning in John chapter 11, we find out that Lazarus is resurrected from the dead, something that we might imagine all the culture would celebrate. But instead, what do they do? They set out and put a plan in place to kill Jesus. Why? Because he is a threat to their system, their authority, their power, their ability to be wealthy and in control. And so they kill him trying to snuff out the movement that he would launch. But of course, we know more of the story, and so when we read in the book of Acts, we discover and find that Jesus' disciples begin now with greater enthusiasm and greater intensity to begin to spread the message of the gospel, the good news of forgiveness. And it is a message that begins to expand greatly throughout the Roman world. And what happens, however, when this message of God runs into the dominant culture. Well, we've seen it many times before this morning, haven't we? So the first answer or emphasis that we could point to is the Apostle Paul. He's in the city of Philippi. And there is a uh, young woman who has a demon. And she has she's a slave. She's owned by two guys. And Paul has compassion on her and, and casts the demon out. That's a good thing, right? You would imagine her owners would celebrate. Now she's healed. No, 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 no. Because her, her illness, her demon possession was their golden ticket. It's how they made their money. And so now they're incensed. And so they demand that Paul and Cyrus Silas be arrested and beaten and cast into prison. A little bit later on that same missionary journey, the Apostle Paul is in the theater, or excuse me, is in the city of Ephesus. And he has a very profitable ministry that is there. And he is communicating to the lost, and the gospel is growing. But there's a guy by the name of Demetrius and Demetrius sees where this is leading because he is a silversmith and he makes cult statues and he realizes that if folk convert to Christianity, they will reject Artemis and he'll lose his copyright and trade. And, and so therefore, he gets some folks together in the Agora and they go to the theater which held something like 25,000 people and they have a multi-hour rally where they scream and shout, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Again, it is a response to this satanic marriage of religion and state. Roman persecution will really get going in the second century as the Caesars and others 
lead, the emperors see themselves as gods, again, little g. And as those deities, as those gods, the temples that exist throughout the Roman Empire support that and therefore have protection and have power as a result of that. Again, it is that satanic marriage just as we have seen it repeated. And the result is that Christians are accused of atheism because they don't worship the emperor. And again, it's just like what we saw in the Old Testament. Now, now let me remind you of the key principle, okay? The reality, whether it's in Rome, whether it's in Israel, whether it is in Egypt or in Genesis 6, is that the minority, a tiny minority, profits off of the oppression of the downtrodden. And what we observe from a historical and biblical perspective is that God is always on the other side. He stands against satanic systems for freedom and compassion and fairness and forgiveness. And don't think, by the way, that that is only true of ancient history. This past week, we had the one-year anniversary of the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, the withdrawal of U.S. forces. And there have been a number of reports that have been come back about what has happened in that nation in the last year. And a lot of it has emphasized the plight of women in that culture and the huge changes that have happened there. And as you think about that, just remember, okay, that those political leaders are supported in what they do by the religious authorities. And they actively oppose the Christian faith. Why? For the same reason that Demetrius back in, uh, in Ephesus did. The same reason that Pharaoh wasn't going to let the people go with Moses. Because he knows that once people get a sense of freedom and they embrace that system, it will overthrow for the Taliban their system that provides them power and wealth and security to this elite few who enslave the masses. By the way, it's not only women's right. Poverty, malnutrition is rampant in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, babies, prenatal care is almost gone. They're dying, low birth weights, not being cared for. And it's not just in Afghanistan, okay? I, I mean, I, I think about Haiti. I mean, here is a nation basically ruled today by gangs uh, of different folks, and they kill and, and take from whomever and whenever they want. Think back on Africa. I mean, we've had presidents for life who ruled in so-called banana republics with an iron fist. They amassed unbelievable, unimaginable wealth. I, I mean, isn't the same thing true of Putin in Russia? And, and the drug cartels in Mexico and the gangs down in Honduras and, and Guatemala and Nicaragua. It's the same story, friends. How in the world do we explain that continuing over and over again in the history of our world and our population? Well, it's very simple. There is a massive demonic presence behind the scenes supporting and making sure that chaos continues and that people are oppressed and hurt and hindered. A final quick item. In this 35,000 foot flyover of human and religious history, I, I focused on the most corrupt but our enemy has another model that he uses. He is perfectly satisfied to allow something that looks kind of like God's plan to, to come into play 
saved as long as he can dilute it or change it. Let me give you an example. In 300 A.D., Christianity was making massive inroads in the Roman Empire. It was growing and thriving despite the fact that you could be put to death for your faith in Jesus. And there was a passion and a commitment that by nature denominated them. And then Emperor Constantine has a dream before a major battle, the Battle of Malvern Bridge, in which he sees a cross, and when he is victorious, he legalizes Christianity, and in fact starts a process by which Christianity will become the state religion of the Roman Empire. And so you have this paradox in 300 A.D., You could be put to death for being a Christian. In 400 A.D., you could be put to death for not being a Christian. Now, it's impossible for me to to think about and detail Satan's plan leading up to Constantine's conversion, but historically, I can tell you what the results were with 100% accuracy. Instead of overthrowing Christianity, Satan made it into something less. The Christianity of the 5th and 6th and following centuries did not have the passion and intensity and focus of that in the pre-Roman times. Instead, now you have all of these church buildings that are built, massive buildings and structures that have to have clergy and others to staff them, which means you've got to have taxes to pay for them. And baptism, instead of being a a, a rite that shows your death to self and, and life to God, becomes really your initiation into the state. You can't hold a political office unless you are baptized. And so there's this massive transition that occurs this more formal, ritual service to the state. I'm not saying that during that period you can't find faith. I'm not saying that that there aren't people who serve God, but it is different. It's not what Jesus and the apostles preached. Church and empire are merged. And we see that when we get into the Middle Ages. There are political systems that are in connection to the religious system. You see that in a place like Venice where there is a church on every corner. And you see that where in the Duke's or the Doge's palace, all the artwork shows the Duke, the ruler, bowing to the religious authorities. And, And yet, All those churches, they required attendance. And and that whole nation, that whole area was marked as Christian. But listen, the physical presence is not the same as a passionate embrace of the gospel. And all you have to do is look at the levels of immorality and moral decay and political warring and oppression of the masses, and they demonstrated that Calling the culture Christian does not matter. So what's my ultimate point? If you look at a culture and you see what appears to be Christianity as the dominant mindset and approach, probably isn't the Christianity that God is looking for. Because God's plan and will and purpose and system are opposed to the strategic vision. And that's why it is so critical for us as we think about our history going forward as individuals and as a congregation, as we anticipate and think about where we go next, and that's next week's sermon.
uh, that we think about how God would have us live in this culture in a way that expresses his values. What actions, what projects, what mindsets do we need to develop? Well, that's next week. Let's close this morning with a word of prayer. God, we thank you so very much for Scripture. We thank you, God, for the history that it unfolds. We thank you, Father, that it reveals to us your ongoing struggle against our enemy, our enemy who deceives so many. God, we look forward to your final victory over him when he will be cast out and cast down. In the meantime, Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would guide us by your spirit, and that we would hear your word and your will, and we would respond to what you would have us do and to be, to be your people, not just subjects of political and religious structures that the evil one puts before us. Thank you, God, for your leadership and direction. We lift this up in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, good. Oh, you're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. You are good, good. Oh, 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 let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now, how about you? Some folks may ask me, some folks may say, Who is this Jesus you talk about every day? 
He is my Savior. He set me free. Now listen while I tell you what he means to me. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything, both great and small. He gave his life for me, made everything new. He is my everything. Now how about you? Please make sure that your communication cards are passed to one of the center aisles. Kids, you can pick those up at this time. All right, let's stand for this song. Then we'll get to be seated again for our uh, announcement song. And we need to get our Christian lights ready. And we need to go to the next slide. There we go. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, all the time, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, all the time, let it shine. Won't let Satan put it out. I'm going to let it shine, won't let Satan put it out. I'm going to let it shine, won't let Satan put it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, all the time let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. Please be seated. What a wonderful morning to be able to be together and to, to worship together this morning. We thank you for, for your presence and, and thank you so much just this last year of just your prayers for not only homecoming, but just for the direction of us as a congregation and, and just the coming together. I, one of the things that was really amazing to me was over the last few weeks, the number of people who, who came together and, and were here at the building many hours uh, working uh, to get the place cleaned up, whether pressure washing, cleaning rooms, cleaning windows, building the stage as, as Mark and Junior and, and Dad did. And it just, it, it's just so wonderful to be able to work together. Uh, it is truly a blessing to be able to, to do this life with you and to, to serve this community. And, and we have such an opportunity uh, to be the light in this community and to share God's word. And so just thank you for your continued prayers uh, with that. As far as our announcements, uh, we do have one update to our prayer list. Um, that is, Randall Wilson, the father of Melissa uh, Goostry, has returned home uh, from rehab, so that is wonderful. Uh, just continue to remember him in your prayers and continue to lift up all those who are on the prayer list as we have uh, Carrie and Claudia scheduled for um, getting results from an MRI and scheduled for an MRI uh, tomorrow and just uh, many others just who are on the prayer list, so continue to lift them up uh, in your prayers. Uh, the youth have a Devo this evening at the home of Tim and Wendy uh, Hinton, and please bring drinks and dessert uh, for this afternoon for that. Uh, a reminder, uh, our blood drive is September 1st, um, so there, is, there still is an opportunity for you to sign up to donate uh, blood and sign up for a time slot, but there's also some ways that we can help out and volunteer. And for each of these, be sure and see Devin to get, um, to get signed up or to get scheduled to help with this. But... Uh, we do need volunteers or would like volunteers uh, for you to sign up to help out for an hour of just kind of checking in uh, uh, people as they come to, to donate blood, but also 
to be able to distribute snacks uh, after they're, they're done. So um, that is the way you can help. And also donating prepackaged snacks and juice boxes, uh, any of that stuff uh, would be uh, greatly appreciated for that day as well. And then following that, uh, just setting the fellowship hall back up. So if you're interested in helping out in any way or just, just want to know different ways you could help, please see Devin and let her know. And then also if you'd like to donate any blood or know of anyone, uh, see Devin as well. Then we also have September 3rd through the 5th, our family uh, Labor Day camp uh, coming up. There is going to be, uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the back of the auditorium, and Julie will be back there, but it also has our schedule for that whole weekend. And um, if you haven't ever come to that, it is, it is an awesome weekend uh, to be able to fellowship together. That Sunday morning, we will have worship there um, at the Labor Day family camp, so we hope that everybody can, can make it uh, that morning. Um, up there. So if you need any more details, be sure and just stop by at the back and, and Julie will be back there. And then also mark your calendars and we'll get more details coming out very soon. But September 23rd and 24th, we are doing a grief seminar uh, with Ron Williams. Um, and that will be that Friday and Saturday, Friday late afternoon and then uh, Saturday. And be praying for that and, and we'll have more information of the schedule, uh, but just uh, and the opportunity uh, for us within that. And then also one last way you can help out. Uh, Kayla Bailey is taking a mission trip uh, to the uh, City of Children in Mexico at the end of September. And she is uh, needing a donation of boys tennis shoes. And the sizes are listed in the bulletin. So if you have the opportunity to pick up any of that uh, and get that to her, uh, the deadline for that is September 14th. As uh, we as a church family have just celebrated 70 years uh, of a presence in this community and all the relationships that we have enjoyed with each other, we are made aware of how important it is to celebrate our milestones. With that in mind, I would like to uh, let you know that this year's father-son baseball trip was also eventful. The trips uh, began in 2001 and two of the young men who made the first trip were Lauren Sanders and Greg Ball. This year, we came full circle with Lauren taking Deacon and Greg taking Isaiah to their first father-son baseball trip in St. Louis to watch the Cubs and the Cards. This is also our first three-generational trip with Larry Borum, Borum and his son-in-law, Robert and his grandson Porter also making the trip. So this tradition continues with the new generation and this is something for our church family to celebrate. Thank you. And I guess we'll uh, fellowship until we go to class. <laughs> <laughs>